Okay, well, thank you very much, brother, and I appreciate uh, being able to be with you tonight for uh, a short time to have a little word in the gospel, and we trust that it will truly be a blessing to those that are listening. You know, that is the wonderful thing about this gospel message. It is not only a message that uh, is for the unsaved, because it's exactly what you need if you're not saved, but it's also a message to the saint, because it reminds us of what we have come into of the great salvation that we've been brought into because of the finished work of the cross and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our prayer tonight, that if you're not saved, that you would seriously consider these things. And if you are, that you would uh, be confirmed in your faith as we just consider a short seven verses from the word of God. I just want to read in the gospel by Mark tonight, Mark chapter 10. Now, if you don't have a Bible, I will just read these seven verses, try to read them as clearly as I can, and we pray that um, you'll be able to understand. Mark chapter 10, and we're just going to go down to the end of the chapter, down at verse number 46, for a story that uh, probably is quite well known, even to people that don't know the Bible. They've probably heard uh, at least this man's name mentioned before, and so... We just uh, will read about him. Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. And it says, and they came to Jericho. Now that's the Lord Jesus and his disciples. They came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples uh, and a great a number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now God has promised to Blessed to us tonight, the reading of his precious word, and we look to him for help and for blessing in the gospel. You know, what we've read here in the gospel by Mark, especially this section, it, it sometimes takes people by surprise, people who are not familiar with the Bible, uh, people who, who maybe know what a Bible is, and they've heard of it, and maybe they've heard verses even quoted from it, but uh, as far as a familiarity with it, there this takes them by surprise. Because so many people, when they think of the Bible, when people start speaking them in terms of the Bible, they immediately think of theology and things that are too hard to understand. And you know what? Sometimes they're right, because there is theology in the Bible. It is there. I have to admit that. And there are things that are very hard to understand. There are, there are portions of the word of God that uh, you know uh, men have not been able to agree on exactly what they mean uh, because they don't have all the facts, they don't have all the knowledge as to what God meant when those words were written. But for the most part, the Bible is a book that has been given to us to understand. It is a book that has been given to us by God because God wants to communicate with us. God wants us to, 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 to see and to know our condition before him. And so that's why he speaks in terms, he, he, he illustrates in ways that you and I can understand. And that's what we have here. Although this is a wonderful story, and it, it, it is a marvelous story of the grace of the Lord Jesus, of his power, to, to open these blinded man's eyes, yet besides the, the good reading, be, besides the, uh, uh, the, the, the value of it as far as a, a social good thing, 
there is a spiritual truth that is rev uh, relevant in this little story that God wants to communicate to you and to me. You know, the three years that the Lord Jesus ministered on the earth, the three plus years, John tells us that if all the things that should be written could be written, that the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And so why is a story about a blind man, uh, someone who, uh, socially speaking, was a nobody, someone who would be ignored except for once in a while, you might throw him a shekel uh, to, to ease your own conscience. Why would this man who, who really had no name of his own, he was just referred to as the son of Timaeus, that's uh, uh, the son of Timaeus, why would he, why would he be uh, uh, included in the word of God? What significance does this man have? What relevance is there for you and I as far as the gospel is concerned, as far as God communicating to us? Well, what we're going to see, and uh, we're going to look at this very quickly, what we're going to see is that there were things that were true physically of Bartimaeus, and they speak of our spiritual uh, a likeness as far as our spiritual standing before God in our sins. And so what was true of Bartimaeus physically is true of us human beings spiritually. And so that's what I just want to consider for a few minutes tonight, because we're going to see there are at least five things that were wrong with Bartimaeus. Five things that you could look at Bartimaeus and say that's that's true of that man. And we want to just consider tonight that even if we have perfect eyesight, even if our eyesight is 2020, no corrective lens is needed. Uh, it is true of us as human beings, as sinners before a holy God. You know, I think of, speaking for myself, of all the senses, the five senses that we have, um, it must be a terrible thing to be blind. Uh, maybe there are some listening, maybe you know some that are blind, some that are born blind and they don't know any difference, that must be terrible. But perhaps some that have had their sight for a number of years and they have gone blind, that must be, that must be terrible and perhaps terrifying. And, and yet, here we are going to see that um, the Lord Jesus is going to stop at this man who, as I said, was a nobody as far as society was concerned, and he is going to teach us some very, very important truths that's true of you and were true of me when I was in my sin. What, what's some of these things? They're very simple. You don't need to be a rocket scientist or a theologian to, to understand this. When we look at this man here, the first thing that we can see about this man was he was blind. Sure. If you were to ask somebody, do you know that man, Bartimaeus, who sits at the uh, who sits at the gate of Jericho, just at the outside of Jericho? They say, yeah, you mean you mean the old blind guy? You'd say, yeah, that's it, because that's what marked this man. He was blind. But there was absolutely no doubt as to his blindness. He probably had to be led to where he sat every day to, to beg. You could see him maybe feeling his, his way down the wall uh, of the city, trying to find where he was going. There was absolutely no doubt in our minds in their minds, that this man was blind. It was true of that man. Well, you know what the Word of God says about us as human beings, as the human race, as those that are of Adam's line? The Bible says that we, too, are blind. And you say, wait a second, I can see quite well. I, I, I can see, uh, you know, I, I have no impairment. I, I don't need glasses. I can see. I'm not talking about physical blindness. I'm talking tonight about spiritual blindness, and this spiritual blindness is true of you, and it was true of me. The Bible speaks that we are blind, at least in two different ways. Maybe you could find more, but I, I, I just want to consider two different ways in which we are blind as human beings. We are blind, first off, naturally, because of what we are, because of Who's our, who is our foreparent? That is Adam in the garden. The word of God tells us in Ephesians 4.18, it says there, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. That's true of us. We were born blind. We were born without spiritual perception, spiritual insight because 
of what we are. We are sinners. We are in Adam. And because of that, we have that spiritual blindness. We can't help that. It is there when we are born. But even more so, not only is there this natural blindness, this spiritual blindness that is ours because of whose we are, that is in Adam. But there's also the Bible speaks of, of the blindness that, that, that comes because of the enemy. You see, there is a real enemy out there tonight. There is one that is warring against your soul, not wanting you to get this thing called salvation, not wanting you to receive spiritual light and spiritual vision. And that enemy is certainly the devil himself. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, he says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of God, of glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in to their souls. And so tonight there is a real enemy. And he is active, him and those that are doing his work, they are seeking to keep you in darkness. They are seeking to keep you blind. They are blinding the minds of them that believe not. Tonight, just like uh, just like Bartimaeus here, who, who was blind. Friend, if you're not saved, you are blind spiritually. You, you, you have not seen what you are. You, you have not perceived the condition that you are in. You know, I'm sure old Bartimaeus there is, he would sit at the corner. Many times as he sat down, he, he might have, he might have uh, you know, wiped his robe off, trying to maybe brush a little dust off, thinking he had it all. And yet, when you walk by, all you'd be able to see is the, is the filth that he had missed, the filth that was on there because of his condition, sitting in the dirt and, and begging. And so we are blind because of, because of our, our, our heritage that goes back to Adam. But not only are we blind, uh, this man here, not only was he blind, he was in darkness. Yes. You know, there are some people and uh, there are different degrees of blindness. Uh, you don't have to not be able to totally see anything to be declared legally blind. There are some people that, that can see shadows and things like that. I, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, and I'm not really sure uh, how to the extent this man was blind. But whatever it was, he was in darkness. And friend tonight, that's what blindness does. Blindness keeps us in darkness, we can't see the light. We can't enjoy the beauty of, of, of God's creation, of all that is around us, because we are in darkness. And yet, the reality is, the Word of God says that the darkness that we are in, it is a darkness, for the most part, that is self-imposed. Because John tells us in John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Oh, friend, the darkness that you are in, there, 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 there is light. The light of the gospel of the glory of God, the light of the word of God, and the message of God as it goes forth. It is seeking to shine into your darkened soul. But for the most part, men are turning away from it. They're, they're covering their eyes from it, lest the light of the glory of God should shine in unto their souls. And because men are in darkness, we see the effects of that all around us, the darkness that is enveloping this world, the, 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 the darkness that, that, that seems to be coming upon every corner of this world today because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Oh, friend, there is darkness. There is darkness. And tonight, if you're not saved, you are in that darkness. And the sad reality is that if you continue in darkness in this life, if you continue without a savior in this life, there is a day coming when you will be cast into outer darkness, where there will be absolutely no hope of light. There, there will not be a single ray of light that will break through that darkness because you have chosen that darkness, because you have decided to stay in that darkness you will experience that darkness for all eternity. But not only was this man blind, not only was he in darkness, perhaps, and this is maybe just my imagination, but perhaps you could maybe smell that man long before you saw him because of the dirt, 
because of his filthiness, sitting on the ground begging, not even knowing that he was dirty many times. If, if he ever washed, not, not knowing where the dirt was, there was a filth that was associated with him being blind. You know what the Bible says about you and me before we're saved? It says that we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses, the, the righteousnesses, that's the best things that we think that we can do. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's how God sees us. That's the estimation of God. This, this filthiness of sin, the, the filthiness of our condition. Oh, yes, we think that we can spruce it up. We can, we can make the outside look good, the veneer on the outside. We can make it look sparkly and shiny and clean. But listen, God sees past our outer exterior, and he sees into our very heart. And what he sees when he looks into our heart, he sees the filth and the dirt of sin. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are all as an unclean thing. Well, that's that's not my estimation. That's God's estimation. That that was his estimation of me. And you know what? It was true. It was absolutely true. Even though I was brought up in a Christian home, Sunday school, meetings, all those things, I was well behaved. And yet the sad reality was I was nothing but a a dirty, filthy sinner in the sight of a holy God. That's what was wrong with this man. And friend, tonight, that's what's wrong with you. We can try to clean up the outside, but it's what's on the inside that matters. I, I, I sometimes remember the story. I was going to visit some folks in uh, southwestern Ontario, not far from where we live now. And I went to visit the man. He had a dairy farm, and one of his daughters, one of the younger ones at the time, she's she's older now. She's grown and has her own family. But I, I can still remember going that day, and she told me her dad was in the barn. And so I went to the door of the barn. It was a dairy barn, and I didn't want to go in there with my shoes and that on. So she said that she'd go in and find him. Now that day, she had received a brand new pair of these beautiful pink rubber boots. And as she came to the door of the um, barn. She stopped for a minute and looked down at her brand new pink rubber boots and looked in on the floor and she proceeded to take her pink rubber boots off and walk barefoot into the barn to go find her dad. But after a few minutes, she came back and she said her dad would be out in a few minutes. And the next thing she did was she took her filthy feet and put them inside the beautiful new pink rubber boots. You know, they still look great on the outside, but I, I would hate to think what they looked like or smelled like on the inside because of where she'd been. And friend, we might be able to do a, a number on the outside. We can, we can make ourselves appear as far as the world is concerned to be so wonderful and that's commendable. But God sees right past the veneer and he sees right into your heart and he sees nothing but filthy rags. Here was a man that was filthy. Not only was he blind and in darkness and filthy, but another thing that was true about this man was that he was impoverished. He, he, he was needy. He, he was broke. That's why he was there begging every day. Now, that's why he would be, make his way to that same spot, probably with the same cup, and, uh, and, and rattle it around, hoping for a shekel or two that, to help him through the day or help him through the week. It's because he, he had a need that he couldn't meet for himself. He was needy. He was impoverished. He had absolutely nothing of worth. And that's the Bible's estimation of us. The Bible tells us that, that basically we are bankrupt. We, we have nothing that we can offer God. Oh, we might have a large bank account. We might have savings. We might have all these different things that, that, that look good on paper. But as far as something to offer to God, we are absolutely impoverished. We have nothing that we can pay. Reminds me of that parable. That the Lord Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 7. I think the shortest parable he spoke. And it was about a man that had two debtors. One owed 50 pence. The other owed 500 pence. And as he is speaking to those Pharisees. In the presence of a, a woman who was a sinner. They are thinking in their own mind. Okay uh, we may be the 50 pence sinner. And that woman certainly is the, is the 500 pence sinner. 
And yet the point that the Lord Jesus was trying to make to them, he said, when they both alike had nothing to pay. And maybe tonight you might consider yourself just a 50 pence sinner. And maybe you don't think that you're as bad as many around and perhaps you're not. But whatever you have done, your sin before God, you are still bankrupt. You are impoverished. There is not a single thing that you can offer God as far as your sins are concerned. Impoverished. Poverty. And not only was this man absolutely impoverished. The reality was this man was hopeless. Uh, he'd been that way for whatever many years. And as far as any hope for a change, naturally speaking, nothing was going to come. He was destined to live and die a filthy, dirty beggar. Hopeless. You know what the Bible says about you and said about me without Christ? It says that we are in the world having no hope without God in the world. Listen, without God, without Christ as Savior, your future is one of hopelessness. Oh, you might have your life planned right out. You you might have every every everything lined up in a row as far as as far as uh, the life now and maybe planning for retirement and those so-called golden years. But friend, what is your hope for after that? What is your hope for when eternity comes? But listen, it is going to come, ready or not, whether you plan for this life or not, eternity is going to come. And if you die without Christ. You will be absolutely in a place without hope forever. And friend, tonight, just as spiritually you are the same as this man was physically, naturally speaking, as far as your condition is concerned, there is no hope in you being able to do anything about it. You can't. You, 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 you can't work to fix it. You can't pray to fix it. You can't do anything to fix it. You are without hope. Just these same as these things were wrong with this man. They're wrong with you tonight. Oh, have you ever really understood your condition before God as a sinner? The Bible is very clear. The Bible, the Bible makes it very clear what we are before a holy God. But you know, if this is all the story, just be a more bad news, and we certainly don't need much more of that in the day in which we live. But as much as was, was wrong with this man, the three, five things he did that was wrong with him, there was at least three things that he did right. And those are the things that changed everything. And, and friend, tonight, even though you are a sinner tonight, blind, in darkness, in, in the filth of sin, in, in this need before God, without any hope, listen, there is something, there is something that can be done tonight as far as your sin is concerned. And that's what we're going to see with this man. But when we see this man, in spite of all his condition, he did three things that were right. What was the first thing that he done right? Well, the first thing that he did right was that he cried for the right thing. He, he knew what was wrong. He, he knew that when the Savior was coming by that way, he knew exactly what he needed. The, the, the Savior said to him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? I suppose the big question to ask you tonight, if you're not saved, do you really want to be saved? Do you really want to know your sins forgiven? Do you really want to be born into the family of God and have a, 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 a hope for eternity? Do you really want it? Here was a man that knew what he wanted. You know, others could have said, Lord, uh, give me a new robe. This one, this one's kind of smelly. Or, or how about a bigger a bigger uh, a container so I can get more money here as I'm begging. No, he, he knew that those things were just, were just evidence of his condition. He knew what the problem was. He knew that his problem was that he was blind. Friend, do you know tonight what your problem is? Your problem is that you're a sinner on the way to a lost eternity. You are a sinner that is in danger of perishing and going out to the hell and then ultimately the lake of fire. Do you know your need? And just as the Savior is passing by this way tonight, friend, do you know what you want? He cried for the right thing. 
you know, we're living in a day and age, at least up here in Canada and perhaps down there in the United States, where there are many groups and they are calling out for justice. And I suppose some of the some of the issues uh, that, that they have been wronged and perhaps uh, forgiveness and apologies should be made. But that seems to be the catchphrase today. Justice. Friend, you, you don't ever want to call out to God for justice for yourself. Because if you were to receive proper justice, the judgment of God would come upon you so swiftly, so rapidly, you, would, you wouldn't even see it coming. But oh, to the sinner, the sinner who understands his condition, like this man here, Bartimaeus, the sinner who calls out to God for mercy. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the Lord Jesus responded to that call. You know what? There's a Savior tonight. And the Bible says that those that call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Oh, friend, have you, have you cried out for the right thing? Have you understood your need of salvation? Have you cried out to the Savior? Because not only did he cry for the right thing, he cried to the right person. I'm sure as the Lord Jesus was passing through, it says with his disciples, there was quite an entourage with him there. There was the, uh, the, 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 the menial disciples, the ones that, that came and went that we don't really know their names. And then there was probably, you know, that super pack, the 12 of them as they're walking along. And, uh, and you know, he, he could have very easily called out, you know, hey, hey Peter, or, or hey, John, or, or Thomas, to, to, you know, one of, those, one of those bigger boys. But no, he knew that the only one that could help him was the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And friend, I'm here to tell you tonight, that the only one who can give you spiritual life, spiritual light, and open your blinded eyes is no one less than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. No preacher, no pope, no minister, no any religious person can do for you what you need. You need the finished work of the Savior. You need the one who went to the cross and there satisfied God as far as your sin and my sin are concerned. He called out to the right person. You see, the Lord Jesus knew all about him. He knew what his need. It wasn't just a coincidence that he was walking that way. There was a man that day, blind Bartimaeus, one that was uh, refuse as far as society was concerned, and yet he was one that was dear to the heart of the Lord Jesus. Oh, friend, do you realize tonight that you are dear to the Savior? There is a Savior waiting. There is a Savior who earnestly desires to save the sinner that will call out and call for the right thing. Oh, God, save me. Oh, Lord, save my wretched soul. And the Lord Jesus is able to do exactly that. How is he able to do it? Listen, the Bible is very clear, and you know the story. There was a time not long after this when he was taken out to a cross. And on that cross, the Lord Jesus was crucified, suffered uh, the horrendous pain, the excruciating pain of crucifixion. But even more so, he entered into the darkness of Calvary. And in those three hours of darkness, he suffered at the hand of holy God, who poured out on him the wrath and the judgment that your sin that my sin deserved. And there Christ on the cross, he bore in love unbounded what none could know. He passed through death and gloriously confounded our every foe. And the very thing that keeps you from God, the very thing that keeps you in darkness, that is your sin. Christ answered for that sin at Calvary's cross. And on the cross, he suffered the death, he suffered the judgment, and he satisfied God so that tonight, the Lord Jesus, God, can forgive you of your sins and give you life, give you light, give you everlasting joy. But, you know, just quickly in closing, not only did he cry for the right thing and cry to the right person. As you read the, the, the context and as you continue to read the narrative, you'll find out that he cried at the right time because it was the last time that the Lord Jesus was going to pass that way. The last time he was going through Jericho, he, he would never come that way again. And so here was a man. I don't know if he realized it or not. It was his final opportunity. Friend, I, I don't know.
at this very moment, Christ is passing your way. He is. He is passing by as you listen to the gospel. He is passing by and he's listening. He's waiting for the sinner to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I have sinned against heaven and I need you as my savior. Those are the ones that the Lord saves. Listen, he is near. He, the thing that I can't understand, even when it comes to my salvation, is why he'd want to save me. I didn't deserve it. I was a sinner and I knew it. And yet, out of love to my soul, out of love to, to my soul, that I might have the forgiveness of sins. That night, back in June of 1971, as a guilty sinner, I just simply understood those words that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And at that moment, God in his mercy saved it was the right time. And when's the right time for you to get saved? Well, the word of God is very clear. God only deals in the now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Ask for the right thing. Ask it of the right person. But, oh, friend, ask right now. Because five minutes from now, it might be too late. Trust God will bless you and bless the gospel.